and welcome everybody to our very own EMS panel. And thank you so much for joining today. It's an absolute pleasure to have every one of you here today. And for those of you not in the know, the EMS stands for, as Sean mentioned, Emergency Medical Services, but it encompasses everything pre-hospital. Now, we have got an absolute action-packed agenda for the next 30 minutes, but before we get into that, I wanted to just let you know that today's discussion will be very relaxed, very informal, very conversational, and importantly, it's not scripted, well, apart from this little bit, um, so who knows what might happen? But one thing I do know is that for the next 30 minutes, we will be discussing all things EMS. We'll be looking back to some of the challenges that the operators have faced over the past year. What are the trends going to be for the future? And really importantly, what other industries can, can take from those learnings from the EMS space? Let's dive into it. Let's turn the clocks back to a year ago. And, you know, we're in the height of the first wave of the pandemic. You'd think that staff are really overworked, morale's at a low, turnover's spiking. Danielle Taylor, give us an idea of, of what it was like on the front line. Thank you. So you would think that. You would think that our staff was nervous and scared, which they probably were at the height of the pandemic. But as we got into it, we saw that all of our staff really raised up rose to the occasion and they were highly engaged. They weren't going anywhere. They were going to do the right thing for the community, the right thing for their patients. So ironically, during the pandemic and probably the last you know, 15 or 16 months, we had staff ready to go. They were putting in the OT hours because their volume had um, of patients had become more acute and, and higher. Um, and now we're actually seeing probably what other industries are not. Our people are tired the height of the pandemic is over and things are going back to the new norm normal. And now they need some time off. Now they're, uh, they're weary. Um, they put in a, a strong 15 months of really busting their butts. And so it's probably the opposite of what some other industries are feeling right now. We were, we were strong through the pandemic and about a month ago, we saw things going in the other direction. That, that, that's really interesting Danielle, and not probably counterintuitive to what you would think. I mean, Taylor, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I think Danielle is spot on and I'm sure, you know, other folks in the industry would agree uh, our folks are designed for this. Um, they, they run toward danger. They run toward things that most folks would shy away from and their adrenaline uh, went much longer than I'm sure we all expected it to. Um, and they, they now really do need to rest and um, yeah. group and we're looking forward to helping them do that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and Ron, for you at Cataldo, what were things like for you back, back a year ago? Um, I think the best way to describe it is uncertainty. You know, uh, when this first happened, I don't think anyone knew what exactly COVID was. How is it transmitted? How do I protect myself, my family? As Danielle and Taylor both said, our industry is known for stepping up when we're in the worst of situations. So our staff will come in when there's a disaster, they'll work extra hours when there's a pandemic, but in the back of their mind, it's the unknown. Um, from an industry standpoint, <clears throat> a lot of our business shut down. There was a period where it nearly came to a screeching halt. Obviously hospitals and everyone went on shelter in place. Uh, you know, Elective surgeries and appointments all stopped. Um, Emergency calls even came to a, a near near halt themselves because people didn't want to go to the emergency room. They were afraid if they went to the hospital, they'd become you know they'd, they'd become uh, exposed to COVID. So, and Danielle mentioned it earlier, you know when they did start to call, these patients were sicker because they waited longer. Their condition worsened. So our paramedics and EMTs really had to step up and treat these patients that were sicker than normal. Um, so it was uh, uh, a roller coaster of a ride. I think, you know, for our folks too, um, again, that unknown, that, un you know, the unknown, how do I go home to my family? I have young children at home. I've got elder parents that maybe live with me. I don't want to expose them. So we had many employees that were working uh, um, many hours and living in the basement of their house or, you know, changing their clothes before they went home and showering just so they could limit the potential exposure. So it's been an interesting 12 months, to say the least. Yeah, I, I, 
could only imagine, Ron. And, and I guess just, just before we go any further, a, a huge thank you to, to all of your first responders to, to everything you've done over the past 12 to, to 18 months. And perhaps we will come back to and start to understand a little bit around from an organisational perspective, how you try to combat some of those um, trends and, and uncertainty and try to remove that uncertainty. But before we do, and, and Daniel, I, th I think you mentioned this, that you're starting to see now the impact of COVID in terms of the turnover numbers. And I think that's fairly apparent now across all providers. So Scott, perhaps you can, you can shed some light on with all the work you do with the American Ambulance Association, what do you think are the, um, or how do you see this manifesting itself in the industry? And what do you think those key trends will um, will be? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, you know, sort of heading into the pandemic, EMS and, you know, EMS and all of its sort of facets, whether it be public safety uh, based EMS or private or nonprofit type uh, based EMS, we're, we're already in what was, really a decade slide of, of available workforce. So, you know, we estimate that we're roughly about 40,000 uh, field providers short right now where we would need to be. And it's estimated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics here at the United States Department of Labor that by 2030, we'll need an additional 42 to 44,000 field providers, which what we're seeing, you know, and I and I would would guess that both, you know, the folks over at Transformative and Cataldo, and I hear this from ambulance providers all over the country, is that um, they have a standing number of open full-time positions right now, with the additional work that their workforce is having to do, um, both of uh, both uh, Danielle and um, Ron sort of captured this idea of fatigue. I think that for a lot of our providers. When they, when you know, Taylor mentioned that they run towards danger, usually that is an episodic danger, right? That occurs, and then an hour later, it's over, and you get to go home, and you get to decompress, and 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 you have those other support services. Well, over the last fifteen months, folks weren't getting to go home and decompress because they were concerned about um, issues with their family, but then that support network that also existed because they um, could leave the job behind when they left work, uh, just. It was just not happening. So we're we're seeing, you know, um, the AAA uh, does a study that um, my company uh, sponsored this year, um, the Newton 360 sponsored this year regarding turnover. We have the first draft, and I think the the final draft will be published um, within the next week or so. But we didn't see a significant drop in I mean, a significant rise in turnover. What we saw was it hold relatively still. And I think some of that was that um, you know people were afraid to make moves and jobs, but really principally what we did hear, and we heard this across the country, were folks who did EMS as a second job, and that is probably 40% of the workforce that we rely on, were either held by their other job and said, we don't want you doing that kind of work, or they were just saying, you know what, I'm gonna hunker down, I'm gonna maybe keep my part-time job on the, on the shelf for a while, and that really, in many instances, we've seen ambulance services, um, you know, close around the country. So it's, it's been, it has been, you know, I would say probably the single largest event in the, the history of EMS from a workforce perspective, next to possibly, you know, uh, September 11th. So it's, it's, it's been, it's, I don't think we'll begin to feel the full measure of this impact for another, you know, two to five years. And, and do, you, do you think providers are now looking forward and taking note of that huge EMT shortage that, that is coming down the line uh, and trying to introduce initiatives to, to, to combat it and, and prevent it? Yeah, you know, so I know certainly in my own private legal practice, um, you know, I'm working, uh, trying to work with my clients to help them come up with solutions. But in addition to that, my work that I do with the AAA, we are working on a plan at the national level to try and address some of the legislative um, opportunities that are available to try and resolve or at least begin to chip away at this issue. You know, we we are not the first healthcare profession. There was a shortage of doctors. There were a shortage of nurses, and and there were efforts made to to tackle some of those. Um, what we're seeing here, at least in the U.S., and and I and I'm pretty pretty sure that this is occurring, you know, over on the other side of the ocean. Um, we're seeing more healthcare professions grabbing up 
paramedics and EMTs because they're recognizing the high level of medical care that they provide. And, and, and frankly, EMS folks tend to be logistics experts, right? We're good at getting healthcare where it needs to be without having, without a, a lot of effort. So um, we're, we're actually not seeing fewer EMTs and paramedics become certified. We're just seeing more people grabbing them because of the unique set of skills and, um, and care that they can provide. That's fascinating, Scott. And, and, and I guess then, or, or, or perhaps to look at it another way, Ron, g- given what Scott is saying there in terms of how providers almost need to become more competitive because people and, and talent are, are being taken up so quickly. What, what, what are Cataldo doing to try and combat, I guess, both start turnover, but also be an attractive provider to, to bring new talent into the business? Sure. Um, Scott gave a a great overview. Um, It's been a challenge even prior to the pandemic. Staffing has been um, really, as Scott said, across the country, um, a a significant challenge for all providers. We're seeing it even more now on the municipal side. So those cities and towns who staff their own ambulance, they never really had an issue um, staffing. And now they're um, pushing out on social media ads and so forth to try and recruit into their uh, space. Um, so it, it, it is an issue. Um, I can tell you that we probably like most other services here are um, trying to encourage folks to uh, come join our team. You don't need to be certified. We'll certify you. So come in. Uh, we'll put you through our EMT program. There are a couple of different options. There's an accelerated program or there's a traditional program that takes about three months, the accelerated about six weeks. Uh, We'll pay you to take the training. So sit in the classroom, we'll pay you. Uh, We're trying to do outreach to other organizations, veterans associations, unemployment, to try and tell folks that because of the pandemic, uh, because people have been displaced and are out of work, um, this could be a new career opportunity for you. So a lot of effort going on um, but as important to the recruitment in trying to change the way in people view ambulance services, I say all the time, um, as we talk about this uh, recruitment effort, no one ever says, I want to go work for an ambulance service. You ask a young person, what do you want to do? I want to be a police officer, a firefighter, a doctor, a nurse. No one ever says, I want to go to an ambulance service. We need to change that. We as an organization or as a, as a uh, um, uh, entity, you know, need to uh, change the, the thought process there that you can make a career of it um, in this industry. So a lot of work going on there, um, but as important to the recruitment piece, the retention piece is just as critical, if not more critical, because our industry is known for high turnover. This is uh, um, considered a stepping stone. I go become an EMT, then I go on to become a nurse. I become a physician's assistant you name it. Um, So how do we retain those folks that we have? Um, And for me, uh, communications, so important. Um, And that's why obviously we're partnered with you all to have that easy method uh, to communicate with our field staff real time on a daily basis. So, um, but yeah, recruitment uh, continues to be, there's no uh, quick fix. Uh, We We're working more together today than we ever have as uh, private uh, uh, Mm -hmm. providers to uh, help assure we can deliver good quality patient care, service our customers well, and yet be competitive and and profitable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Ron. And and, and you mentioned retention there. Taylor, I'm keen to get your view, you know, as as, as the chief of people at Transformative, maybe some of the, you know, we'll get onto training education in a bit, I think, but maybe some of the more sort of fun uplifting stuff you're trying to do to keep people in the business you know obviously there's been a lot of doom and gloom the past year how are you trying to boost the morale and keep people happy on the job that's a great question a very good friend of mine once said that the people team or hr team is not the love boat so we don't um we don't throw parties our job is not to um, you know, give everyone the snacks. Well, we do love to give people the snacks. I think the real heart and meaning of culture and engagement and really at, at the root of that is ultimately the goal of retention um, is to respect your team members. Um, mm-hmm. So right now we're trying to understand what their individual pain points are. And in, in that, obviously not trying to find a one size fits all solution for engagement um, or for morale. 
each team member is motivated by something different. So the key is really just truly believing in your people, understanding what they're looking for, and then doing your best to provide them a great experience to respect them. Uh, a good example of that is um, not expecting folks to always stay late, which is so systemic in the business, obviously. Um, but our team members have lives and we need to acknowledge that we need to fill their emotional bank account as much as we take from it and make withdrawals. Um, so really just instead of um, doing the things that normally folks would think about pinball machines, snacks, yeah. um, those types of things, what we really just try to do is treat them like people. Um, and to make sure that we understand what, what satisfies them um, and what they need to, you know, find that balance with work and life. I, I absolutely, and I think I think that's pretty applicable across school industries as well. And I think Danielle, I know that you're doing a lot around. Rob mentioned about training and education. You're doing a lot around that and transformative. How how are you thinking about using that as a way to try and attract more talent into the business? Yeah, I think with Scott's statistic that he gave about the people who are recertifying in the space yet not working in the traditional ambulance space, we have this void where all of our institutions or companies are fishing from the same pond. So it becomes really challenging because there's some things that private ambulance services can't compete with or um, or offer that are, are, are as competitive as outside using the skill set of a paramedic or an EMT in a non-traditional ambulance space. So we had to figure out ways, just like Cataldo did and running you know, their own EMT programs and things such as that. So Ron, you had mentioned um, a stepping stone and you know, getting into EMS. I've heard that for the past you know, 13 or 14 years of EMS as a stepping stone. And earlier in my career, I was really offended by that because I wanted to be a, a manager. I wanted to be a leader in EMS and have that career pathway. And I was often told like, it's a stepping stone. It's okay. If they're here for two years, it's okay. And it took a lot to adapt to mentality where I actually was okay with that. So I don't think of it as a stepping stone anymore. I think of it as a foundation. And I think in EMS, we need to be okay with helping building that foundation and using our training and education techniques and tactics to build something that's valuable to someone's long-term career plans. And if they convert to wanting to stay in EMS, like the four of us, we'll add Robin, the five of us have, then fantastic for the industry. However, if we continue to mold and develop them into a PA, into an MD, into a nurse, respiratory therapist, a flight paramedic, critical care, whatever it is, we are also, also helping our biggest filter in the way we look through things, which is our patient. So I think it's time that we become okay with that. So some things that we've done in regards to development and ensuring that we're reducing turnover are creating career pathways, much like many other ambulance services are currently doing. And I'm sure, I know Taylor is, and I'm sure Ron and Scott are advocates of this. So we've created pathways that take somebody who are not yet certified into an entry level role. It could be chair car or vaccinations or testing. And then we give them a really solidified timeline with very clear expectations. If you see yourself here, this is what you need to do. This is what we'll provide to you. So some companies, including I believe Cataldo and Transformative, are, are have been compensating or have played around with compensating people to do on-the-job paid training. So we have paid people to take the EMT program. We have paid people upon graduation from the EMT program. And we're currently trying to figure out and analyze um, the data that says, you know, we're which was more effective? What was the motivator? And we're now finding that money is not necessarily the motivator in a lot of these cases. So as much as COVID has driven people currently away or needing a break from what they're doing in EMS, it's actually drawn this large group of resources of people who felt a call to help during COVID. So they may have functioned in the vaccination or testing world, but now we're transitioning to doing some other more patient facing um, roles within the organization. So defining the goals and pathways, setting timelines, ensuring the reasonable expectations are communicated very effectively and are understood in the way that we mean them are some of the things that we've done. And lastly, you know, online learning became the norm during COVID-19. Everything went remote. So it's how do you continue to use that technology and ensure that we can maximize it to create a good experience for the learner, but they're adult learners and that most of these people who we're building a foundation for are not traditional collegiate students. 
Um, so online learning can be really challenging. So we have to figure out what is the best hybrid approach. And we should also evaluate what our learning objectives are and ensure that we're truly having meaningful engagement. So people looking at their instructional staff, their equipment and their objectives are going to be more key than ever. Danielle, that's that's so interesting. And um, I, I love the learning programs and progressing people through the organization and, and initially incentivizing them through additional pay. And, and I guess, broadly speaking, you're, you're talking around a transformative in, in changing your relationship with your employees. And Scott talks and, and, and you know, that that is really key to Blink and, and Blink, yes, is a piece of technology. It's, it's an enabler, but there has to be a cultural change from the from the organization and a desire to get much, much closer to their business. And that's where some great results can come. And Scott, I know you've talked around previously that you compare the employee employer relationship to that of a spouse and, and actually if your wife or, or husband said I love you once a year and, and that was it you probably wouldn't have the best marriage and and actually playing that forward and, and what you just taught there Danielle was, was so true in terms of what well, I think what transformative and, and Ron I know this firsthand from from what you're doing at Cataldo in really stepping up and wanting to get much closer to, to your workforce I, I guess looking then broadly I'd be really interesting, and, and perhaps Scott, we start with you and, and then open it up. Um, the role that technology can play, and, and um, Danielle and Taylor mentioned some some awesome initiatives that they're running, uh, but perhaps your view on what role can technology play in, in accelerating some of those programs, but, but also helping combat those challenges. Yes, with staff turnover, but also enabling providers to deliver a better standard of patient care, which is, as, as Danielle said, is really the aim of the game here. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, one of the things that I think, you know, for us, those of us who have been in this since the early 90s, you know, the social dynamic part of the employment relationship was actually the piece that kept most EMS providers tied to the profession, right? It was the folks that we worked with, our partners, the interactions we had with other folks in the workplace. Well, one, as a function of being, you know, workforce shortage, we have fewer opportunities for people to be back at the station you know, joking around and, ha and having a good time. And so, you know, like much of what's occurred, you know, over the last decade with social media, there is a need, right? We, I think we underplayed as leaders the need for that social connection to your coworkers. And so when I look at products like Blink, um, where you have the ability, you know, I think leaders are recognizing we need to create that virtual space because our folks are not getting the actual face-to-face -face time that they might have otherwise received or, or experienced when they worked in this profession 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, I think the role of technology is sort of a couple of pieces. One, it does, you know, provide that ability to keep the human connection, right? But that, you know, I, I do not know, you know, when I first started in 1990, I took a dollar an hour pay cut from stocking shelves at a grocery store. And so, you know, it wasn't a job that you did for the money. It was, it was something, it was something bigger than that. Now, I think, um, the connection and providing that connection between you and your coworkers, and you know, ultimately at some point, really a patient in the work that you do. But I think also rec recognizing that, you know, EMS folks tend to sort of only understand EMS folks. So if you have a spouse at home, or you have family at home, or you have friends who just don't really seem to understand what it is that you do you know, products like Blinker or even a Newton 360 have the ability to create this environment where you can remain connected to people who are your, your sort of support network, virtual or otherwise. And, and really, I think a lot of people have, have demonized some of these social media platforms saying, geez, you know, my, third, my 15 year old will text me from the living room for a glass of water. And, and I sometimes get offended by that. But in reality, if we can take the technology, augment, uh, augment the existing social dynamic in the workplace, you know, really, there's a lot of really great things that have come out of social media, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Fr frankly, guys, I wouldn't have met you all, right, it, had we not connected through those platforms. So I see this as an opportunity for employers to, one, um, put enough information in the hands of their, their leaders and their employees so that they can perform better. You know, oftentimes as leaders, your average frontline uh, supervisor, and we don't have any research in EMS, but your average frontline supervisor in retail only coaches, mentors, engages employees roughly six to 8% of the time. So you now take that person and you put them in a distributed work environment 
we're probably talking maybe two to three percent of the time. And so that, you know, if in fact you encounter coach and mentor those people two or three percent of the time, well, then you really need all of the help you can get. And you need to ensure that you have enough information from the underlying, you know, um, business metrics, the stuff that can help you connect with that person to make sure that when you do have that, that it is the most enriched and meaningful um, encounter that can occur. So, you know, I, I think that there's, they've gotten a bad rap oftentimes, but really, if we think about where we might be or all of the really powerful, wonderful things that, that uh, social media or technology type enabled um, tools have provided for folks, uh, you know, I, I, this is just EMS evolves quickly from a patient care perspective. This is one area that I have seen a very slow adoption and it has been to the detriment of the service. So I think this is, this is a real opportunity if an EMS leader is not looking at tools like Blink, you know, like a Newton 360, frankly, you are missing the boat. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely, Scott. It, it's all about, we think, try, trying to meet employees where they are, you know, whether we like it or not, people my age, we, we, we're used to communicating on our devices and, you know, we may be a bit sort of tentative about face-to-face -face interaction as, as weird as that may be. And Ron, I know, you, you know, at Catala, you have quite the sort of tech ecosystem with, with Blink, you know, with, with Prodigy MS, your e-learning platform, which I'm sure Rob would have been so happy to speak about and, and, and sing its praises, but how- And Newton, right? And Newton, of course, yeah. I, I, was, I was, let me get to it, man, let me get to it. Sorry, George. Um, <laughs> and, and so how do you see that whole tech ecosystem helping what you're trying to do as, as a business at Cataldo go, going forward, um, you know, five, 10 years from now? Yeah, a lot of great discussion. Um, so I want to touch on a little bit of what Scott said and then uh, back to Danielle too. So as Scott said, you know, we, we have a young workforce. They're used to the technology, the social media, right? The messaging from his daughter from the other room to get him a glass of water. That's common practice these days, right? I would prefer to go to the base uh, day room and have a conversation face-to-face -face with the employees, but as organizations our size, both us and Catalvo and Transformative, we have 23 base locations. I can't see every employee every day, but sometimes I do need to message every employee every day. So having that technology is obviously critical. And as we've said, most of them like it. They prefer to receive the message over uh, their handheld device versus uh, me coming to them in person and talking to them. Uh, Back to what Danielle said and how we can utilize this technology to help uh, with the recruitment and the retention. Um, you know, I use the, the expression, it's a stepping stone. Uh, Danielle referenced it as building a foundation, which is true. And, you know, many of us, um, several of us on this uh, panel today, started entry level uh, in, in worked our way up the ranks through um, EMS. So it can be done. And there are many of people throughout our organizations at varying levels of uh, management and, and disciplines that have done exactly that. So how do we promote that through technology to show people that it can be done? Um, similar to you know what we've done here and what it sounds like uh, Danielle and Taylor are doing a transformative, uh, creating that roadmap for the employee to see how does the technology um, at the individual's fingertips show them that roadmap uh, for them, you know? So where am I in my career? I'm in the system as a entry level chair car driver and I wanna become an EMT. Well, the technology kind of drives you down that road to how do I get there? You know, you take the 120 hour curriculum EMT program, you do this, this and this, and now you've hit this next milestone. And can, continue to kind of coach them through uh, the career laddering, if you will, um, opportunities in this industry. But, you know, we, we do, again, uh, 850 or so employees. We added about 1,200 people throughout the height of COVID with vaccinators and testers. So upwards of 2,000 employees, remote, um, significantly uh, throughout our service area. Uh, technology is critical, um, both the social piece the educational pieces we've talked about uh, utilizing Prodigy and many other platforms um, to be able to recognize and uh, um, acknowledge our employees. Um, so, Thank you, Ron. I could not agree more. I think technology will only continue to play a, a greater and greater role in the industry. I guess 
Danielle Taylor, given that the powerhouse of technology that, that Transformative truly is in, in all of the different tools and systems you invest in for your employees, what, what's your take on this discussion in terms of how can this really empower and, and help you keep your employees and, and perhaps drive some of those initiatives? Yeah, I would just say that Danielle and I have this conversation often is that there's so many platforms and there's so many options and there's so many things that we could use to communicate or you know engage with our team members and it's hard to make the decision on what the one tool is because they already have so many tools or sign-ons or things that they're trying to manage through um, the organization or any organization so um, really what we're trying to do is provide real-time communication with them um, it's Ron mentioned obviously a remote workforce but prior to it even being remote it was just completely transient and 24-7 um, so think about the team members that are working on the 12 hours that we're sleeping. If you work at Transformative, you don't do that, of course, but um, for those organizations that are less busy, um, you know, folks are sleeping when their team members are there during the day. So communicating with them at all hours is really important. So having a clear communication strategy um, with your folks is super important and something that we prioritize as a top three for the organization. Um, Danielle, do you have any additional insight? Yeah, I think as we were initially testing the use of Blink to figure out how it would be impactful, Taylor and I and the team had some pretty big revelations about, you know, could we truly engage people in a meaningful way? There's that word again. And often emails get overlooked and um, text messages are abundant. And, you know, as I'm sitting here on this Zoom call with all you great people, I have all these notifications going off on my phone. It's Prodigy, it's Smartsheet, it's all of these different things. And it's really overwhelming. And I remember talking to um, my niece just a couple of weeks ago, who's much younger than I am and very much in the age of technology in her mid twenties right now. And they do feel, the millennials and Gen Zers do feel overwhelmed by too much stimulation at certain times through technology, but love to Snapchat or Instagram or text when they want to. So I love the fact that Blink enables everything in one place. So they know if I'm going to get communicated to by transformative, I can go to this place. I don't have to search for an email or check out a newsletter or, or try to find a text or try to find a phone number. The directory alone, the hub, it simplifies. So one of the things that Taylor has brought to our organization over the past year was also using this filter on the clinical side, I use, you know, the patient, but on the people team side, she uses what can make our team members lives easier. And Blink has been able to, to do that and has almost been this kind of saver of time for us and given our administrative you know, minutes back to us um, and sent a meaningful message. So I think technology is important, but the right technology is important. So engagement, like Scott said, and developing the career pathways like Ron talked about, but I think finding one place that the technology is meaningful is important because we're throwing so many things at people. They need to, they need to have a hub and Blake actually has the hub. Thank you, Danielle. I mean, th this has been such a, a fascinating discussion and, and thank you all for, for joining. Just just one eye on the time. And, and what, I, what I do want to do, though, is go to one closing sentence from, from all of you in terms of what do you think other industries can learn from what, what you've been through, what the EMS industry has been through over the past 12 months? And perhaps, um, Danielle, we, we, we start with you and, and let's go around. There's so many things, I guess, um, as I think about one thing that another industry can learn, I guess it's about resilience. So everyone in the panel talked about the type of person who's successful in EMS runs towards the fire, they show up, they, they want to be part of the solution. And this is a 15 month problem. So we're used to dealing with mass casualty incidents that can last two hours, four hours, six hours, and then we get the break. It's been 15 months and now we're starting to get a break and we're really tired. So I think the resilience that's required and the dedication of the leadership team to hold everyone together, recognize your team members' attributes and values, and this whole theory of power down. As a leader in any industry through a large crisis, healthcare or otherwise, allowing your team members to utilize their skill sets and rely on them and power down helps the leadership team. And I think that's one of our biggest takeaways. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. Taylor? 
I think it has to do with just understanding the value of people. So organizations often focus on the revenue that's coming through the door and, and other financial KPIs, but realistically, until you have an organization that has no people and is completely run by widgets, you have to focus on how you can make sure that your team members feel valued, respected, to Danielle's point, um, are engaged and you're really working on creating an ecosystem where they can be successful for whatever that means for them. Awesome. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Um, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I think to sort of echo off of the earlier comments, I think one of the things that the last year a lot of employers have figured out when they started sending some of their administrative staff home was recognizing, you know, people work so that they can live, not the other way around. And I think recognizing the impact that your company has on that individual's life, right? Because you don't just employ the individual, you employ their company. My fire chief um, at our holiday uh, event every year would first have the firefighters stand up and recognize the firefighters for sort of their volunteer time and then sit them down and then stand up their family members and say, you have done without this person on important holidays, important events, children's graduations, birthdays, because they went to go help and be in service to others. So I think probably the number one thing that at least I think organizations could learn, and we learned this pretty quickly was there is a human cost to someone working in your organization. And you need to, the, the, the employer who figures out how to make that cost as little as possible, right? And support that employee to Taylor's point, the whole person, um, they will be successful. Totally agree. Thank you, Scott. And, 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 and Ron? Um, I would just say uh, employee engagement. Um, you know, I, I say to our folks all the time, both ownership and, and to the field providers, um, we don't sell a product per se, right? We don't create a widget. We sell our service. It's our employees and their skill set. So engaging the employees, making sure they feel satisfied in their employment, um, we get the hurdles out of the way so they can do their job successfully and, you know, all of that through, you know, a good constant communication and engaging the employees. Thank you, Ron. I, and, and I completely agree. And one thing or two things that really come out there is, is the relationship three, the relationship the employees have with the em employer, communication and just how important engagement is across the um, across the organization so once again a, a huge huge thank you um, for not only everything that has uh, that has happened over the past 12 months and all the work that, that you and your staff have done but also for taking some time out and, and joining us today just before we go though I think my, my colleague George has, has got some questions that are coming in from the audience that we would love to to ask you if that's okay we do have a few, Matt. We do have a few. And first up, um, from an anonymous attendee, we've got what needs to change in terms of government funding for, for the EMS industry. We know that it's significantly under, un, underfunded compared to a lot of the other healthcare industries in the US. And so I know there's been some progress over the past six to eight months in terms of funding, but, but, but what needs to change there? Scott? Why don't we go with you? Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's it's tough here in the United States, at least on the government spending end, right? It, the, the monies related to EMS are roughly 0 0.8 to 0 0.083 of the total national healthcare expenditure. So when you look at, um, you know, the reimbursement received from both the Medicare program, which is our, you know, our retiree 65 program, or the Medicaid program, Right. Generally speaking, they've been reimbursing EMS agencies under their costs now for decades. And really, until there's some focus and understanding and, and, and representation by government of, of really the health care, I think a lot of people will often hear, I'll hear, geez, you know, I, the bill was X number of dollars and I only went one mile. Well, the most important thing that occurred during that trip was not the distance you were, it was the health care that got provided in the back. So I think we need to be a little more dynamic in the way that we're looking at this, not only from a reimbursement perspective, but then other potentially, you know, tax incentives or tax breaks for people working in, in EMS, um, you know, opportunities for, say, reduced you know, uh, federal uh, HUDback mortgages, or, um, you know, as Danielle mentioned, if it's not a college affiliated paramedic program, it's not eligible for federal student loans. So I think there are, uh, you know, endless opportunities at the AAA, we are, we have our work plan drafted, we're going to be pitching it to the board in about two weeks. Um, that, you know, has you know, probably 20 different items and things that we think need to occur that are all, for the most part, legislatively backed. But I think the number one being 
we need to start collecting data on EMS workforce period and understanding the scope of the problem. You know, where are we at today? Where are we heading to? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it won't be a simple solution. We didn't get here, um, you know, in one day, it's going to take some time to get, to get out of it. Absolutely. And, and, and anything to add DT or, or Ron? Could probably go on for hours, if not days, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you. Scott did a nice job. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think just very quickly before we go, Ron, I think there's a pretty tailor-made question for you here. It's, it's, do you use the Blink app as the main source of communication or do you have other, other channels that are used for certain messages? And that was directed to me, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, uh, we do. It is our main source of uh, all communication. Um, we have uh, eliminated or uh, stopped issuing email addresses to employees. Um, those that had it were grandfathered in, but there is a cutoff date that that will go away and everyone is 100% on Blink. Uh, for the primary means of communication. And then obviously they navigate to the hub to access all other uh, methods of technology in which we make available to them. Great, great. DT, uh, are you going to be brave enough to switch off emails or? We would love to do that. It's <laughs> definitely, a definitely a transition. Yeah. Um, one of the organizations that we manage has team member email addresses and one of them did not. So it was always a challenge making sure that uh, the domain got through whatever the private email address was. So this combats that challenge as well. And it's been building a culture. So we ran a couple of pilot groups, one as small as five people and the largest as large as 56 um, in teams. And we created a really nice organizational structure that Blink actually helped facilitate better span of control and messaging. So it's part of an empowerment plan. It's part of making sure that the leadership structure of the organization has the tools and resources to allow it to be successful with that power down mentality that I talked about before and ensuring that span of control and whoever's leading a team or a section or a district, et cetera, um, has the ability to communicate appropriately. So between the content moderator role, the admin role, the ability for people to like or comment, the ability to notify someone or not notify someone, um, do the requirement where they must acknowledge the message these are all features that will allow us to hopefully use Blank as our primary means going forward. And I can tell you as a you know, longer uh, time user, those uh, features are game changers. They really are. You know, someone, one of our managers just put something pretty critical out yesterday to the team and the acknowledgement feature assures you that everyone's acknowledged it, read it, uh, at least received it, right? I can't make them read it, but received it. So no, those those are nice features. Thank you, thank you, Daniel and Ron. And Daniel, the, the chocolate smarties are on their way, so so look out for those. Matt, that's, that's my British friend. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much.